So we move directly on to our next session, and I am going to welcome up onto the stage Professor Derek Bunn, a colleague at London Business School, uh, who's going to be leading a panel to talk about challenging contemporary energy systems, paving the way for transformation. Derek. Thanks, sir. Can we all go up? Yeah. Please, yeah. So if you, if you sit, you Thank you, Julian. So um, we have uh, um, a, a, a challenging set of issues to go through at the moment. I think the energy transition um, has been with us for about 20 years since the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, it's had its ups and downs. Various progresses have been made. And you know, in some respects, I mean, I feel that the, uh, the easy things might have been done already, and that the big challenges are, are kind of facing us at the moment. And so to kind of put some of those things in perspective, we have, we have three guests who are both prominent in their fields and can bring a lot of expertise uh, into this area. I'm very pleased to, to welcome uh, Daniel Hanna from, from Barclays, uh, Albert Chung from um, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and uh, Marta Basquez from BCG. I'm going to ask them each to kind of just say about a minute, uh, for about a minute about themselves, um, and what they do and what their expertise is. And then we're going to go into some of the big questions. Uh, and I'll post, post some, some topics there that I think um, are kind of crucial uh, over the next uh, 20 years, really, in, in kind of building on the energy transition and making a kind of a, a substantial impact on decarbonisation. Uh, there will be an opportunity for, for questions, uh, both online uh, and, and from the audience. Um, in, the, in the way that I think has been explained to you already, uh, if you just scan the, the, the QR code, and um, th they will appear on my, um, my um, iPad here, and uh, I, I have the, the, uh, the privilege of deciding which ones I might, uh, I might kind of uh, ask the group. So if, we, if you could just spend um, maybe 30 seconds introducing yourself, what you do, uh, and your expertise. So, so um, Daniel, please, yeah. Uh, Daniel Hanna, the Global Head of Sustainable Finance at Barclays Bank. Um, we've got a commitment to mobilize a trillion dollars of sustainable and transition finance by 2030 and to align our financing towards a net zero pathway. And we are um, also investing 500 million pounds in early stage climate technologies. Perfect, thank you. Albert, yeah. Um, first of all, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, so I noted earlier that I'm the only person here on stage who's not an alumni of LBS. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you in particular for, for welcoming me here to speak today. Um, so my name is Albert Chung. I'm Deputy CEO of Bloomberg NEF. Uh, we call ourselves BNEF for short. Um, and we are the research business within Bloomberg uh, that focuses on low carbon transition. Um, so all we do every day is think about um, the past, present, and future of, of global low carbon transition across energy, transport, industry, um, agriculture, uh, increasingly fi finance as well. Um, and uh, I've, I've been there about 15 years at this point, so yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and I promise that you would be an honorary alumnus after this. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm Marta Vasquez. I've been in upstream oil and gas exclusively for more than 20 years, the first 10 at the Slombridge, so I have field operations, practical uh, experience, and I have the privilege to be leading at BCG the topic of the decarbonization of the upstream asset. And I would like to also make the disclaimer that uh, we firmly believe, I firmly believe, that oil and gas demand will decline in most scenarios. And there is a big challenge to make sure that the pathway is clear on how we do this in the most responsible and low GHG emissions way. And that is my mission. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to some of those points, I, I'm sure, in the next half hour. So I, I think I'd like to start by, by taking a kind of a perspective view, um, looking at, at the current trends, looking at, in particular, the challenges in, in the trends. And, that, and I think, Albert, you'll be best placed to kind of start that off with your, your work at Bloomberg. Uh, Th your thanks, Derek. Um, so I, I, I'll tr try and kind of talk a bit about where, where we see things at the moment. I think. To work in energy transition is to kind of live with contradiction and to have cognitive dissonance every day because 
you're always seeing record growth. Things are always moving faster than ever, and the progress is incredible. But at the same time, it's, it's never enough. And you're never, like, the transition's never moving fast enough. So maybe just to back that up with a few kind of facts and data points that we see from BNEF. Um, last year, for the first time, we saw more than a trillion dollars invested into low carbon technologies. So think of renewable energy plants, um, electric vehicles, battery storage, hydrogen, um, carbon capture and storage, all these technologies that we know are needed to, to achieve net zero. And a trillion dollars is not a small number. It's, uh, it was a fantastic number. Um, and it grew 30% year on year. So I don't think there's that many industries growing 30% year on year. So that's really great. Um, renewable energy installations this year will be um, almost 500 gigawatts, again up 30% from the year before. 90% um, of new power plant capacity that's being installed is clean. So almost all, it's, if you're building a, a coal or a gas plant today, you're an absolute minority um, and, and shrinking. Um, electric vehicles, we think um, today there are probably 14 or 15% of the market globally, which is an incredible achievement. We used to count the number of countries that had 1% EV sales. And we, the first country, the second country, wow, we now have three countries that have 1%. Today it's 14% globally, and we think it's 30% in the next three years. So just in incredible progress. Um, however, lo lots of challenges. Um, you will have seen, um, we're starting to see offshore wind projects being cancelled. Um, or auctions for offshore wind failing, and that's probably the biggest kind of red flag that we've seen recently. Um, and that's because of supply chain disruption, in cost inflation, and there's this window right now where the costs of key renewable en energy technologies have risen, and so the project developers who signed contracts in the last year or two to deliver projects at a certain power price now suddenly find themselves unable to achieve those, those power prices that they, they said they would do, so they're having to cancel their projects. And that's causing a lot of pain, and it's putting at risk some of the, the energy and climate targets of, of certain countries. And we're also seeing rising competition between countries. Um, we all know that these technologies are largely produced in Asia, many of them produced in China. Anywhere between 50 to 80% of the supply chain of these technologies is in China. And so you have the US, Europe, India, other countries stepping in and saying, well, we want a piece of that pie, so we're going to start um, putting in trade barriers and subsidizing local production, which is, is creating some tension as well. And then I think, that going back to the cognitive dissonance, just with all that growth, um, if you take that trillion dollars, you add in another 300 billion that's going into power grids investment, which is also critical for the transition, you get to about $1.4 trillion going into kind of net zero compatible kit that's, that's being deployed at the moment. Um, we think we need to be doing three times that much, about $4.5 trillion per year for the rest of this decade in order to get on track for net zero by 2050. So that's the scale of the challenge. Um, and I, we, I, I know we want to talk about hard to abate sectors and so on, but I, maybe I'll leave it there for now and uh, we can come back to other, other challenges as well. Yeah. But thank you very much, that's good. And, and I think just where that, that, those trillions are going to come from, I, I think um, we, we, we've got a third speaker that can perhaps say a few things about that. Um, I, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the, the supply chain issues that you brought up. I mean, to what extent do you think those are temporary? Or do you, do you think there really has been a structural shift and that, and that this, this idea that the costs are going to continue to come down is now historic and that, that going forward the, you know, the supply chain issues are, are crucial and possibly becoming more crucial? Um, there's good news on that front. Um, so, um, as I said, during the energy crisis, because of these disruptions, um, solar became more expensive for the first time in 15 years. Batteries became more expensive for the first time in 15 years, and, and wind as well. All those things have been coming down for a long time. So solar is now back down, and back down, in, in fact, to record lows. And because the supply chain responded very quickly, that's been an incredible turnaround just in the last year. So on, on solar, we're, we're in a great place. Actually, it's hurting the manufacturers because they've, they've now over-invested, so now they're facing margin pressure. Uh, but that, that's a sort of slightly different story. On batteries, um, we're about to put out our battery price survey for this year um, in about a week and a half. Um, and I can't tell you the result of that, but I can tell you it's, yeah, th things are looking better. And then um, wind is really the one that's still having pain. And I, I do think it will return to a downward cost trend. It's just taking a little bit longer because it, it, it's easier for the other supply chains to respond for a variety of different reasons. Um, the raw materials are um, uh, smaller markets that can respond more quickly. 
the supply chains, frankly, a lot of them are in China, and those companies can respond more quickly. So I, I think wind is just going to be a little bit slower to respond, and that's why you've just got this window where projects are really challenged. But ultimately, we, th we think it does turn around. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that's good to hear your optimism. We, we, we may come back to some of the, sure. those issues shortly. I, I mean, I'd like to pass over to you now, Martha, and particularly uh, from the, the oil and gas perspective. Um, in, in some respects, there hasn't been quite so much progress there as there has been in power generation. And you know, I'd like to, to kind of hear your thoughts on, on kind of what are the possible easy wins that we might have in the near term, and what may need to happen in, in the medium and longer term. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Just to ground us on some of the facts, the oil and gas industry contributes to 5.1 gigaton of emissions, scope one and two. This is about 15% of the emissions in energy. And, uh, but when you put together the scope three emissions, that is about 24 um, gigaton, which is more than 50% of the emissions in energy. And uh, you are nodding, so I think you, you, uh, some of you are, are familiar with this statistic. It, it is material, okay? It, it matters just intrinsically from the footprint. Now, I started my introduction just saying that um, there is only one way going forward, which is a decline for the demand and the supply of oil and gas. Still, there is a big role to play for this asset class. Uh, however, not all the barrels are equal. Okay? And uh, we believe that whenever, uh, whenever we put together all the barrels in the world, uh, both what is existing, what is in development, what is in exploration, what hasn't been uh, explored yet, uh, some of those barrels will stay on the ground. And the winning barrels will be the low cost and the low emissions barrels. Now, you, you say we haven't made uh, enough progress there. The pressure, I, I want to make a third point around the pressure that is, in, is high. It has been high and it is increasing. It's extremely hard and we will hear more from Daniel. Uh, and I was just in a conference in, uh, in London uh, over the last two days, increasingly hard to get access to capital. It is not debt, but especially when there is a uh, a transition from the big owner to the mid and the small cap company. Um, they, they need to demonstrate that they are doing this in the most competitive way uh, to get access to capital. Talent, extremely difficult to access the talent pool that we have in this room and to actually retain the great people that we have, who we, by the way, we need in order to decarbonize other industries as well. Right? And uh, finally, there is a huge pressure and um, on the tax front, on the fiscal front, I think most people here will have heard of the IRA in the US. Australia has made progress in methane, the, the carbon border mechanism in Europe, but also the methane, uh, the methane emissions tax outlook. All of that is putting pressure. This is an important point to remember. Now, why else we haven't done enough progress? Um, I think what, what we notice is extremely hard uh, for, uh, for companies to tackle the energy trilemma. I think for the last three years, this is a topic that we have spoken at length, but we can leave it so vividly in new ways, even in the UK, right? In the UK that we have the offshore petroleum licensing bill, you know, uh, being proposed at the moment so that we can have annual licensing rounds. There is a big element of energy security, okay? Energy security that if countries like the UK have it in the top of mind, imagine other countries in the world who are very early, not only in their energy security, but the second point is the, the economic growth element. And on top of that, having to decarbonize and do this uh, with a net zero mindset is extremely hard sometimes to, to reconcile these tensions. And possibly the fifth point that we leave every day whenever we work with some of these companies is that it's extremely hard to change the context in which people work. It is not only about the operational and technical challenge or the commercial and the financial challenge. It's about creating the context for people to make different choices every day, right? The people who are doing offshore and onshore operations have to have the right performance framework and incentives to say, hey, I'm going to take eight hours to restart this well instead of two hours, okay? To minimize flaring, because this is one of the most practical levers. So to transform 
each of these companies, it takes time. It is not going to happen in weeks, so I can expect uh, the earlier we engage, um, the better, but it will still take uh, months. Um, and possibly the last, the six point, just in direct answer to what can we do today versus what might take longer. Uh, this is a positive news, by the way, but 40% uh, of the emissions, uh, um, I mean, there is a dark side, but a positive news. 40% of scope one and two emissions in, in, in my industry is from methane. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, has, it is worrying from one side, but on the other side, we have viable technically, operationally, and economical solutions to abate these emissions today. It is not unrealistic when a company says by 2030 I will be zero methane operations. Okay, so this is really important together with energy efficiency and flaring. There goes 50% of the footprint. Okay, now longer term, what people are, what we need to bet, uh, to bet on in order to really have a net zero pathway is two main things. Electrification for which renewables or nuclear or anything that is uh, lower uh, EEG emissions is, is really critical enabler and carbon capture. So CCS and fortunately, just to end in a, in a positive note, part of the actions that we see many oil and gas companies taking is actually launching these new businesses. Right? And I think if some, of the, if some of the gains in this very profitable industry go towards launching these businesses as soon as possible, I think it is a huge contribution to the energy transition. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Martha. There's a lot in, in what you have said there. Um, I'd, I want to pick up very quickly on a couple of points and then, 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 then bring, in, bring in Daniel. I mean, methane is very topical at the moment, and you are right to suggest that that, that uh, is a possible um, significant win that, that can happen. I mean, as, as probably most people know, or not everyone, I mean, methane is about 80 times as uh, detrimental as carbon dioxide in terms of emissions, uh, and, and a lot of it can be solved by better operational performance. Um, what's... What's the quality of a kind of international government governance and audit and uh, in some way authenticating the, the, the supply chain for, for methane? I mean, given that a number of countries are putting in uh, regulations uh, that oil and gas you know, should, should have methane limits below certain levels, the EU has just done that and, and so on. Um, I mean, I mean is, is the quality of monitoring sufficient to be able to kind of uh, authorize that process. Yeah, no, thank you, Derek, and uh, no. <laughs> uh, and, and I would like to say more. Uh, no, uh, however, in some jurisdictions, we're moving really fast, and I think it is the combination. Uh, when it works best, we have a combination of market, you know, pushing forward shareholder and the, the commitments of the companies, but also the fiscal and regulatory support, when you put them together, it can, it, I think it can be quite powerful uh, to create not only the pressure to have to do it, uh, but also a way to monetize the low GHG emissions hydrocarbons. And the, the two more points, the certification of this low GHG emissions gas is an increasingly important topic. And MIQ is an example, we work closely with them, is an example of a third party organization who says, I think we were talking before, um, it is not about monitoring methane emissions at a country level, it's hard to take action. We need to go to the asset level, to the facility level, to be able to track down and be able to certify, hey, yes, you know, along the value chain, this LNG cargo is indeed, you know, low GAG um, methane emissions. So, yeah, there is the certification, and possibly the last part, I just would like to give the audience and the panelists here, confidence that we do see and we are working with companies who are taking action to prepare you know, for more market and uh, government support and incentives, but also to be able to monetize these low GA emissions, GAG emissions gas. Thank you. And, and there's just one other thing that, that you, you mentioned um, and that, that I think possibly could link back to an aspect that Albert, you could comment on. Um, you, you talk about the, the kind of the inevitability of, of demand destruction for, for oil. 
Um, uh, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, a lot of that depends upon the transportation sector and the transportation sector basically um, in that context is all about electrification. And I just wonder um, what the scope is for electric vehicles uh, in uh, third world countries and you know, in, in Africa, in, in South America. Do we really expect transportation uh, in developing countries to move away from diesel? Uh, I, 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 don't know if, I don't know if you want to comment or maybe Albert first of all in terms of, of right. trends you're seeing on electrification. I mean globally, not, not just in. I'm um, sure, maybe just very quickly. I think um, if you take our sort of base case view from our long-term electric vehicle outlook, um, ro road fuel demand peaks sometime later this decade. Um, and then starts to decline from there. Um, but we, we need to go a lot faster if we're going to reach net zero. And I think emerging market countries are one of the big, um, you know, call it challenges. Um, and adoption in those countries is really, really far behind. So when I talk about the 14 or 15% penetration of EV sales globally today, um, that's because the big markets are doing that heavy lifting. China, Europe, uh, US is catching up. And those are responsible for, you know, I don't know the number, a very large portion of auto sales, but it overlooks many, many, many small markets where penetrations are naught or 1%. Um, I think this can change. I think it will change first in the kind of two and three wheelers market. Think of, you know, yeah. uh, bikes and um, tuk-tuks and things like that. Buses as well, I think those will change first. But even with cars, I think there's, there's room for optimism because we see in the second half of this decade, between 2026 and 2030, depending where you are in the world, um, it will become cheaper to buy an EV than to buy an equivalent quality internal combustion engine. 2030, 2031 in emerging market countries for cheaper cars. So it's, it's a, bit, a bit further away in those markets, but it is coming. Um, and that's, I think that's when it starts to become interesting. Can, can, I, can I come in here? Because I, I, I think it's worth just stepping back. I mean, five years ago, one in 70 new cars were EVs. Now, this year, we'll probably be at what? One in four, one in five? And so just in five years, we have seen an exponential growth in EVs. And I, I take your point very much on, on emerging markets, but actually here, the majority of mileage done in emerging markets is two wheelers, not four. Uh, and you're seeing in places like India, huge innovation already on, in terms of EVs, uh, in terms of the two wheeler market, but then also battery swapping and the sort of infrastructure around that that can really start thinking about how you create an ecosystem there. So actually India kind of gives me hope that again, you know, what, what we have seen is technology has consistently outperformed the expectations, particularly in places like on solar and, and EVs. I think the big question, if I, if I can keep going, uh, the big question for all of us, though, which I think, and, and Marta and uh, Albert did a fantastic job scene setting, the one thing we haven't talked about was interest rates were at a rock bottom level for the whole last decade and a bit in which we've seen this tremendous growth. So I think actually one of the big challenges, speaking as a, as a banker, is you know, is the transition affordable at 5% interest rates? I, I think that is, and you've seen that impact in the markets in terms of valuations of some of the very big renewable companies coming down 70% since their peak. Um, and it is definitely getting harder to raise capital for even great companies. I mean, we work with a lot of early stage companies and you know, that process is now probably taking more like 12 to 18 months when you know, just a year ago it was probably taking about six. So there's definitely the, the, the trend has shifted and I think it's important to reflect that. But, and I think it was right that I go last because money in some ways I think is, is the last thing to worry about. I think as, as Marta and Albert very well set out, if the context works, if the, if the project works, the transaction works, money will find a way. And I think there's really two big challenges in my mind that we need to solve for. One is we need to scale renewables. I think Albert absolutely correctly talked about it. Threefold increase in renewables needed. We need to electrify what we can and then power that through renewables. And the second is that we need to really tackle these hard to abate sectors that Martha kind of talked about. 30% of the emissions that we need to reduce in this decade is gonna come from new technologies that need to get scaled up. So you take those two things and I think that then presents two challenges. Um, at Barclays, we've funded Moray West, which is going to power half of uh, Scotland's electricity through offshore wind. Um, and in my past life, I've done a lot of renewable financing, including the largest uh, concentrated solar park in, in the world. But the big challenge and the big stat that sort of was missed out is if you strip out the big countries, China and India, renewables are basically flat since Paris. And I think that's that's a disaster. So how do we scale financing into the emerging, you know, the, the lowest, 
the countries that are most exposed from climate change and actually have the biggest opportunity to leapfrog, I think is one of the big challenges. We're going to see more around things like using the World Bank and other catalytic type capital crowd in the private sector. But really, we've got to collectively think about how do we go after uh, and really electrify at pace um, and empower that through renewables and emerging markets. The second one is about the hard to abate sectors. So how do we tackle other sectors where you can't use electricity uh, and uh, power those through renewables? And so that's going to need new technology. Um, Marta talked a couple of those, carbon capture, hydrogen, the likes. At Barclays, we think the hydrogen market is going to grow eightfold over the next sort of couple of decades. And we're already starting to see momentum coming in there. But we need to move faster to tackle climate change. We've got to take great ideas from ideation to IPO. And at Barclays, we're trying to create this kind of escalator to speed that up. That's why we've got some very focused partnerships around the early stage. There's uh, something that we do with Unreasonable. And actually, I was with them yesterday with 20 new companies that are thinking about all these sort of challenges. Um, we've backed 300 of those companies over the last, since 2016. They've gone on to raise over 10 billion of financing, employed more than 24,000 people. Um, and some of them have then gone and listed. We're also deploying 500 million to support these technology companies directly through equity. Carbon capture, some great British companies like Brill Power in the energy storage, or Proteum, which is a hydrogen solutions company. But we've got this gap at the moment, this kind of scaling gap. And broadly, I think that we've got very good as an industry at scaling software companies, right? Facebook, social media, these type of companies. But the issue there is adding a million people onto those platforms is a marginal increase in capital. In climate tech, you basically have an exponential increase in capital. You have more and more capital that you kind of need to deploy. And I think that the finance industry as a whole is not very well suited for, for tackling this missing middle of capital. And that's something that we're very focused on. I think a couple of things that will help, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, the EU New Green Deal, the sort of work that the UK is doing around providing CFD backstops for some of these new technologies. But overall, we need to innovate there to really scale up these technologies that can tackle the hard to abate sectors. I'll pause there. Thank you. And, and I think that, that cued into a number of things that I was going to ask you <laughs> about. Um, but, I mean, you mentioned hydrogen. Um, and, I mean, I mean hydrogen, to, to me, seems to be a kind of a major challenge because you're trying to kind of create a new economy almost um, o overnight. I mean, it's not just you, you're bringing in something like an offshore wind and it's going to kind of slot in where there was previously other kind of generation. You know, you're, you're, you're developing something which has got production, infrastructure, and market. Um, I mean, how, how does that new economy come in? Because you, you've got the demand, the infrastructure, and the supply, all of which don't exist at the moment. Um, I mean, do, do you see that being done through major policy commitments, or do you, do you see it being done through, if you like, organic growth, where the, the industrial sector does it first because they need to do, and then, and then from the industrial clusters it, it spreads out? Um, it, it's clear that we need long-term storage, and it's clear that hydrogen is the best solution for that. But I mean, I, I think, I think the, the investment will is, it makes a lot of sense, but, but how does that kind of translate in, into the development of the sector? So I think it's great to say a question. We could probably do a whole panel on just hydrogen, and I'm sure Albert and Marta have got very strong views on this as well. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with you that it is the solution for long-term storage. I mean, I think their batteries um, and deploying other technologies, we've backed a company called Energy Dome that uses compressed CO2 that can provide more than 24 hours storage at a very cost-effective rate. So I think there's a lot of innovation in the storage. But I think the challenge where I see hydrogen fitting in is the things where you can't use renewables and storage in a simple way. And where you may have excess renewable capacity, then I think, to your point, you could then transfer it. But the economics around hydrogen, I think, are, you know, there's a lot that we could talk about there. But to come back to your framing, which I think was right, I think one of the big challenges is we've got a coordination problem. So you're a professor of decision sciences, and I think that's exactly right. So you need both investment from the producers and the consumers. But both producers and consumer are looking at each other and saying, well, you go first. And that, that leads to a sort of suboptimal equilibrium. And so that's why I think policy has to play a really key role. The Inflation Reduction Act, which I think you know, estimates, and again, probably these are Albert's numbers, I'm sure that I'm borrowing, you know, could unlock over a trillion dollars in carbon capture and hydrogen, both of which have been mentioned. Big policy tool. We're seeing the hydrogen hubs here in the UK as well. I think that's really, really important. 
Um, but the key thing that we need to deliver, I think, is kind of from a, to make a project bankable is offtake. And so how you can have long-term offtake of these things, which really comes to this, this point around, if you like, the Inflation Reduction Act is trying to pump prime the production, but we need to see the consuming sort of businesses effectively commit to long-term offtake. So if you look at, I was involved in financing the world's largest green hydrogen project in, in, in Saudi Arabia and Yom, and effectively that was the key piece. There was a long-term offtake. Often in these places there aren't. Now, there is some discussions going on in US and UK policy tools, effectively, how do you provide that sort of support in the absence of it as a temporary thing and then get the private sector to come in? So I think this, this is a very live issue. I think you put your finger absolutely on it. Um, and there's a lot of work going on across the finance industry and policy to think about what are the solutions to tackling that. But I think, Albert, I'm sure you've got... No, yeah, Daniel makes some really important points, and I'll just maybe build a little bit and add, add a couple other, other other points to that. I think... Um, one thing that's important to know about hydrogen is I think there is now a, a, a consensus, a narrowing consensus around where hydrogen should actually be used. And it used to be this idea that hydrogen will be used everywhere and we use it in our homes and our cars. And I think all, a lot of those things have gone away. And it's really understood now there's some really key applications where hydrogen is required to decarbonize, like steel production, um, ammonia production, chemicals, you know, some, some parts of ref refining. Now, the issue is that those are big industrial companies whose products are commodities and therefore if they are not competitive, if they decarbonize first, but, uh, but become uncompetitive because they've taken on a load of cost, then they lose. So they've, they've gone green, but they go out of business. And if you want to buy green hydrogen today, it's probably going to cost you 5 or $6 per kilogram, depending where you are in the world. Most of these industrial companies say, we need it to be $1 or $2 per kilogram if we're going to be able to uh, switch to hydrogen and still be competitive. So that premium for them, like somebody's got to help deal with that. So whether it's government mandate subsidies, um, uh, th things like that. But, but what's interesting is when, once you feed that through, so if you're a steel manufacturer and you switch to hydrogen and it increases your costs by 10%, it makes you uncompetitive. But for the car manufacturer who's buying that steel to make a car, the car that's sold at the end is maybe only 1% more expensive. And to us as a car buyer, you'd, you would find that negligible. You would say, I didn't even notice that. So I think there's, to your point about offtake, I think there's really um, a, a, an important focus on how do you get the whole chain to recognize this value or somehow kind of connect the user through to the, the kind of green hydrogen, whether it's through kind of green certificates or other programs that can really connect it through. And I, I think that's where, well, it needs more work and more thought to, to figure that out. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and in terms of the chain upstream, I mean, are, are the oil and gas companies enthusiastic about developing their capabilities in hydrogen or are they dragging their feet? Yeah. I think um, um, more broadly, many of them are enthusiastic not only about hydrogen but about carbon capture and renewables. I think there is at least um, two examples, and I, I hope it's okay to expand beyond uh, outside of hydrogen. But just I think in the last two weeks we heard uh, Total Energies is a partner, partly owner of the largest offshore wind farm in Scotland and it has just started 114 turbines. So I think that is a very tangible example of something that a traditional oil and gas integrated company is doing right, to, uh, to expand. Uh, there is also, I think over the last six months, uh, ExxonMobil in the, U in the US acquired a five billion pipeline operator to support the carbon capture agenda. So I think it is, we need them in this business. We need them in the future in the future businesses, and I'm, I'm very glad to see that. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask the, the panel a kind of a pointed question on this? Um, you know, we, we understand how to decarbonize the electricity system in this country, for example. What, what do we do about the gas network? Um, I mean, do, do we expect hydrogen to be the, the solution for decarbonizing the gas network? Do we think the gas network should become a stranded asset and we shouldn't use it anymore? I mean, let me go first because we, we, we are decarbonizing gas networks at the moment. And by the way, um, we need the gas network to be transporting gas, low carbon for the foreseeable future. I think first, before we, I, I hand over to you to speak about the hydrogen uh, uh, network. And most, I would say 90 or 95 percent of the emissions are methane leaks. So which we can actually abate today. 
So I genuinely feel really positive you know, about the outlook. It is almost low hanging fruit um, to decarbonize the, the gas network, Derek. So by decarbonizing, you, you mean putting hydrogen through the existing network? No, I mean, I mean transporting gas with low GAG emissions impact. I'm talking about ah, the operation. Yeah, the transportation. Uh, the switch, no, the, the switch yeah. of fuel, that is, a, that is that, uh, that's a different topic, right? But the point is that we will need gas between now and 2050. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but do you have any thought on decarbonizing gas? Yeah, um, just to say, you know, we have a, our own net zero scenario that we've built at BNF that goes out to 2050 and kind of tries to answer the question of what's the technology mix that will decarbonize the global energy economy. In that outlook, in the net zero scenario, we still have oil, we still have gas, we still have coal in 2050, um, alongside some carbon capture and storage, a, little, a tiny little bit of carbon removal for, for some of the really, really difficult things. So I don't think we're saying these fuels go away and, and you still need to transport the hydrogen. If you're going to have hydrogen in some of these um, facilities, you're going to need to transport the hydrogen as well. So there will be a role for molecules that will be retained in a net zero world, but it will be smaller. It will be quite, quite a lot smaller in some cases. So I think the challenge and the question for gas networks is what does that transition really look like for them? How do you avoid kind of um, in investing in stranded assets? And th th there you need to go much more in depth into what's the role of this particular asset? Is there a, a carbon capture and storage facility nearby which makes it net zero compatible and so on? It get, I think it gets quite specific at that point. Interesting. Thank you. Do you have a view on this, Daniel? Yeah. I mean, I, so the only thing I would add is, that, is also this point around carbon capture, because I think we're going to have to use pipes to effectively transport CO2 the other way to, to storage. So I think, and I think I'll pick up on Albert's point, which is maybe to tie it a little bit back for things like hydrogen. But I, I think we're going to see the emergence of very large projects like NEOM, but then also there are going to be some very specific on-site situations where you're trying to decarbonize something that's just very hard to do so. And then there'll be the emergence of these sort of smaller projects. So it's kind of a, a barbell outlook. And I think that context then becomes really key because I think we can all model things um, you know, very well now. And uh, you know, you've got some great modeling that BNF and others have done. But actually, the, the, there is the practical context of when you're trying to decarbonize a situation. And that may mean that you're using something that, from a model perspective, looks suboptimal but needs to be delivered. So I think we're going to see these bespoke small projects. That's something that I mentioned, Proteum. That's where they're very much focused. And these really large mega projects that are going to kind of think about how do we get things like green ammonia and others to the most cost effective uh, place possible. Thank, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to, to ask you a question, Daniel, about infrastructure in general and infrastructure financing. Um, I mean, we, we've, we've spoken a lot about, about the technologies which are coming in, but when, when you're thinking about electrification in general, the, the degree of network expansion that has to occur is enormous, no, not just the kind of high voltage, but, but local as well. I mean, um, what, what's the kind of the, the, the solution there? I mean, is there scope for a lot more third party finance in infrastructure ownership? We're already seeing in this country, for example, the separation of the system operator from, from the, the transmission ownership, which should open up the potential for, for you know, independent investment uh, in a regulated way on infrastructure assets. Is that an asset class that would be attractive? Um, a regulated asset class, obviously, and more of that, or, I mean, it has to happen. No, it, it, no I yeah. think yeah, it's a very good question. I think it, it definitely does. I think we have seen infrastructure become a sort of recognized asset class and actually increasing amounts of capital going into financing it. I mean, you're absolutely right. I think the amount of capital, I think Albert touched on this as well, that needs to go into grid infrastructure is, is, is very significant. We're gonna have to see um, companies that own and run grids you know, increase the amount of investment, you know, many fold over the next um, few years. And that needs to be financed. I think it will be financed through equity. I think it will be financed through infrastructure debt and, and the like. So, um, and then that effectively has, has got to be paid at some point as well. So I, 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 think, I, I think the capital actually for infrastructure is, is actually an easier discussion to have because in some ways that's scaling what we've already got. And I think you've seen a number of very large funds like Brookfield and other raise large amounts of capital to deploy into these sort of decarbonization stories and other things. 
For me, the bigger challenge actually is this scaling of the next set of technologies, these sort of technologies for the hard to abate sector and that sort of missing middle I talked about, rather than say the infrastructure financing. I think you know, the, the, for the right project, the right sort of scope, money will find its way for that. But I actually think the, the sort of this midding middle of capital for hard, the sort of new technology, the next wave of climate tech, that's gonna require a bit more innovative thinking. And, and there's a thinking there because um, that, that technology is unproven and it's very high risk because of that. Or be, because it, its kind of economic role is not understood or, or, yeah, I th it, or even that it, it may not be the right solution. It, it's yeah. all of the above. I think it's all those situations. And, and I think we should you know, think about EVs. I mean, to, to, to use an example just to make the point, but I think the first EV came over like more than 100 years ago. Um, we are trying to scale some technologies that, um, not all, I mean hydrogen and carbon capture have been around in some components, but some of these other areas we are trying to scale technologies that are very nascent, um, and you've got effectively risk on risk. You've got new technology risk, you've got infrastructure risk, you've got sort of regulatory risk as well. So I think it's, there is a number of different um, dimensions there that even with you know, certainty, as I have, that we are going to see this kind of uh, decarbonization wave continue, so it's just a question of how fast, um, you know, for an investor, that's a very hard set of risks to break down. And so that's where, you know, public-private kind of coordination can really work. And I also think coordination across, um, both within the industry, you know, insurance, private equity, banks, but then I think Albert made a fantastic point, which I wholly agree on. We're gonna have to start thinking about value chain financing and value chain solutions, and how do you effectively look through the entire ecosystem and work out how to effectively uh, effectively create the look through that allows that situation to be bankable um, across the ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. For that. That, that leads into a, a question which is not a surprise in this institution, it's, it's coming from the audience, uh, and that is you know, the, the, the scope for, for new businesses, for startups, for, for uh, innovation, uh, for the kind of things that, that graduates from business schools like to do. Um, I mean, do, do you see the, 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 this, the energy transition being a, a kind of a big established company game, or do you think there is a, a kind of fertile ground for for a lot of new, new, new innovation to, to come in uh, and grow, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you I, yeah. first, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think it's both. Um, I feel like I'm gonna maybe repeat a lot of what Daniel's already said, but um, I, I actually think the sort of startup ecosystem in climate and energy tech has been pretty healthy the last couple of years, it's slightly more difficult at the moment that, than it has been, but um, lo lots of venture capital money available for those companies developing new technology. Um, much more hard tech than I'd seen in the previous round. I think when we were doing this a few years ago, it was a lot of software companies trying to optimize this, this or that bit of the chain, which is incredibly important. But I think now there's a, an understanding that, okay, there's some really hard hardware-based issues, like can you apply electrochemistry to mine tailings to get clean copper out the back because we have an issue with copper production you know, re really difficult things um, that are now able to attract capital, or until this year, I would say we're able to attract capital to, to, to do exciting new innovations. Um, and, and then at the sort of later end, and again, I'm, I'm just repeating what Daniel's already said, but um, there's a lot of money available for sort of proven technologies, infrastructure um, funds, um, you know, obviously bank debt, and, uh, and large, large corporates. So I, again, apologies, Daniel, for saying what you've already said, but there is just this missing middle right now for kind of, the first of a kind projects. Um, and so I, I'll give an example from hydrogen. So our team, our hydrogen team has this um, market share pie chart they produce, which is all of the kind of hydrogen electrolyzer manufacturers around the world and how much market share they have or how much uh, production capacity they have. And it looks like a, um, like a sea urchin or a, like a dandelion or something because there's just hundreds of tiny slivers. So if you, if you wanna develop a hydrogen project, how do you choose a vendor that you trust is gonna produce a, a piece of kit that you can rely on for 20 years when it's an emerging industry, there's 100 suppliers, all of whom have just built their first factory. So it's almost like you could, it's starting the company now is doable, but it's sort of how do you get to the point where you're the, the trusted one? How do you get the finance for that first project to demonstrate that your thing works? That, that's where the, the tricky part is. So can I, I mean, 
agree with everything Albert said, so I'm, I'm trying not to repeat it. But my journey around sustainable finance really started here at London Business School. Um, and I, I, with a few others, launched uh, the first green online search engine. Uh, and we had a bit of success, planted like 250,000 plus trees, uh, and then it didn't work out. And so I had to become a banker instead of a successful one. <laughs> um, but so do I think, to your question, Derek, absolutely there is a huge space for that. And I, and I think um, there's a lot of innovation going on in the sector. I, I, you, know, I, you can get quite um, sad and depressed, I think, about where the state of, of climate can be. And you spend any time with people that are innovating entrepreneurs, it really does give you faith. And I think you know, some of the stats that we've talked about today, you can see the impact of technology. And I think that's what's gonna really ultimately win this for us, right? It's just scaling great new ideas. And there's a number of different ways to do it. I think so, you know, I, I've mentioned one of the partnerships that we have at Barclays, Unreasonable. There's a focus one called Carbon 13 that we're working on. So if you've got a great idea, you know, have a look. You know, you can see we run a number of corporate challenges as well. So we've kind of worked with some of the very large companies to say, okay, well, how can they decarbonize, say, ports in Southampton? We've got a challenge on at the moment. Got a great idea on that? Have a look on my LinkedIn. You'll see a link to it. You can kind of go to it or just email me. So I think this kind of ecosystem, and actually we just, we're just about to publish a research piece, and 99% of the people that we uh, spoke to, companies and entrepreneurs, said the UK is a great place for climate tech. Um, and you know, I think 70% of the companies that we talk to see decarbonization as a big driver of value for them going forward. So I think there's a, you know, all the challenges that we talked about absolutely are there, but 100%, you know, there's definitely capacity to do it, and I'm sure there is someone sitting, you know, many people probably sitting in this room who've got a fantastic idea that's going to make a big difference to this whole situation over the next few years. I think that's a very good point on which to finish this panel. I think um, I think we've covered a lot of interesting issues. I think we've covered a number of, of that kind of very uh, big intractable problems to a large extent. Um, but I, but I think there, there's more optimism in this panel than, than I, I was kind of expecting to start with, and so. So with that in mind, I want to thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you.